My name is Kari Oenschläger, and I'm a program curator here at the Goethe Institute Boston, where we really um, focus on Berlin Alexanderplatz in its many forms right now. We are streaming the German TV miniseries on Eventive. Um, it's free of charge. You can watch it another week. Um, and hopefully you have already seen parts of, parts of it or even all of it. Um, we are also showing the, um, the new film version uh, by uh, Burhan Kobani in the Coolidge virtual screening room this weekend and next weekend. And at this time next week, uh, next week, Sunday at 2 p.m., we have a live Q&A with um, direct director Burhan Kobani. Um, and you can join us there as well. Or it's on, you can access it on YouTube. And we will post links to all of these events here in the chat. In addition, um, no, uh, many of you have uh, already spent many hours watching this mini series right now, and hopefully you have lots of questions for our panel. Um, we, you are welcome to post them um, in the Q&A box at any time during our conversation. We will monitor the Q&A box and we will collect your questions and we will answer them at the end, uh, towards the end of the webinar. Um, and I'm looking forward to a lively discussion. Um, we have asked both our panelists to open the conversation with a brief statement, followed by an exchange between the two of them, followed by your questions. The last time I have discussed the Lynn Alexander Platz, I was in high school, and I'm really looking forward to uh, hearing from both of our experts today. Both of you have studied the book and Fassbinder's adaptation thoroughly. Johannes Binotto joins us from Zurich, Switzerland, where he's a researcher and senior lecturer in cultural and media studies. He's a video essayist and film critic, and currently he's leading a research project on video essays as a new form of research and teaching. He has published widely and in his publications approached Fassbinder in an unusual way by writing about the happy ending in films by Rainer Werner Fassbinder. Peter Jelovic joins, joins us from Baltimore, where he is a professor of history at Johns Hopkins University. He specializes in cultural and intellectual history of Europe since the Enlightenment, with an emphasis on Germany. In 2006, he published the book Berlin Alexanderplatz Radio Film and Death of Weimar Culture. Uh, a warm welcome to both of you. Thanks for joining us today and looking forward to hearing from you. And I think the um, We'll hear from Peter first. Thanks. OK, so yes, I will share my screen. Is that working? Can you see? Dublin? Perfect. OK, um, yes. What I'm going to do is speak um, briefly about 10 minutes about Dublin, about the novel Berlin Alexanderplatz, and about some problems or, or difficulties or challenges, I should say. Uh, that one faces when trying to translate it into the filmic medium. So uh, Alfred Dublin was born in 1878 in Stettin, which is now the Polish city Szczecin. Uh, he was born into an assimilated non-religious German Jewish family. His father, who owned a clothing store, abandoned his family when Dublin was 10. So his mother took, off, took him and his uh, four siblings to Berlin where two of her brothers lived. They resided in Berlin's poorer neighborhoods near the Alexanderplatz. Now, oops, let me see. I'm trying to, oh, here we go. So um, this is a map of Berlin in the 1920s. Here is the center of Berlin. This is, so to speak, official Berlin. Here's Unter den Linden with the Brent, oops. Nope, we want to go back. Uh, with the Brandenburg Gate, uh, with the Royal Palace. And the Alexanderplatz is here, it's on the periphery. Now to the east of Alexanderplatz is Friedrichshain, which is a proletarian neighborhood. And that's where the family moved um, when uh, Dublin was 10 years old um, and where he later uh, opened up his medical practice. To the north of the Alexanderplatz is the so-called Scheunenviertel, which was populated by Jews from Eastern Europe. Um, at the beginning of the novel, and also at the beginning of Fassbinder's film, when Bieberkopf comes out of Tegel prison, he takes a streetcar and gets off in the Scheunenviertel, and he's taken on um, by some Jews. 
So you've got um, a proletarian neighborhood here, a Jewish neighborhood here, but it was also, there were some dicey corners and there was a lot of criminality going on in these areas. Now, um, Dublin had a classical education. He attended a so-called gymnasium, which allowed him to attend university and to become a medical doctor. But he did not like the classics. And I regret to say this in today's context, he was not especially fond of, in fact, he was very suspicious of Goethe. He wrote in retrospect about his school days and I quote, I confess that I didn't know what to make of Goethe or Schiller. I began to open up to Goethe very late, but he never became my man, end of quote. Dublin revolted against Bildung, against elite culture and education, which he believed was simply a tool for the bourgeoisie to cement its social preponderance. Dublin disliked what he called the classical ensemble, das klassische ensemble, he wrote in 1922, for a long time, the tame classical ensemble remained completely outside my purview. It was alien to me. Goethe did not enter my mind at all. Slowly, I made a connection between the classical ensemble, including schools and teachers, and the obtuse bourgeoisie. The same elements that run the state politically also publish newspapers, collect paintings, build museums, go to concerts and theaters boring, often despicable elements that can only be resisted. I saw that the same bourgeois strata are the ones who worship the classical ensemble. And that's why Dublin never regarded his literary works as art, as Kunst, in any conventional sense. Now, after completing medical school in Freiburg, where he specialized in psychiatry, Dublin returned to Berlin for his internship. And thereafter, he established the medical practice in the neighborhoods where he had grown up east of the Alexanderplatz, that is in what is now Friedrichshain. His patients belonged to the poorer classes, and he came to see that many of their medical and psychological problems were the result of poverty. Dublin regarded himself as much as a social worker, as a medical doctor. His interactions with his working class patients reinforced his anti-bourgeois beliefs. Now, Dublin was not only a practicing doctor, but of course, he also was a very prodigious author. He began writing and publishing around 1910 when he penned short stories in an expressionist style. In the ensuing years, he tried out various themes and formats. He wrote novels about a Chinese revolution in the 18th century. One novel was set in the Thirty Years' War. Another was a work of science fiction set centuries in the future. But his masterpiece was Berlin Alexanderplatz, which appeared in 1929. Now in that work, various themes come together. As a doctor, Dublin saw social misery on a daily basis. And he realized that there was a wide gray zone between so-called respectability and criminality. It was hard to make an honest living in Berlin in the late 1920s. And that was the gray zone in which Franz Biberkopf lives. What Dublin also learned through his medical practice in the proletarian neighborhoods of Berlin was that the so-called little people were at least as complex as any bourgeois. And Dublin translated that insight into his characterizations of Biberkopf and the other figures that populate Berlin Alexanderplatz. This is one of the many things that attracted Fassbinder to the work which he considered by far the most important book that he had ever read. Fassbinder hit the nail on the head when he said this about Dublin's novel. In Berlin Alexanderplatz, the same degree of grandeur is accorded to the smallest, objectively speaking, and most mediocre emotions, feelings, moments of happiness, longings, gratifications, pains, fears, deficiencies of consciousness, of seemingly inconsequential, um, yeah, unimportant, insignificant individuals, the so-called little people is normally accorded an art only to the great ones. The people whose stories Dublin tells in Berlin Alexanderplatz, especially the protagonist, the former teamster Franz Biberkopf, later pimp, homicide, thief, and pimp again, 
are credited with such a differentiated subconscious combined with an almost unbelievable imagination and capacity for suffering that one would have to look long and hard for their equal in world literature, end of quote. But the novel was not only about Bieberkopf and the other characters that populate it. It was a novel about the city of Berlin itself and the way that city molded its citizens. What made the work so innovative was the fact that it evoked the city as a web of discourses that suffused the minds of its inhabitants. Much of the text of Berlin Alexanderplatz was made out of snippets of what we would now call infobytes, derived from a variety of sources. The oldest layer um, derives from oral popular culture, storytelling, commonplace sayings, children's rhymes, songs, both folk songs and current hits, or tunes cranked out by hurdy-gurdy players or sung by street singers. Other texts derive from the print media, the Bible, newspapers, handbills, and posters. And a third layer of text comes from the newest mass media, radio and gramophones. Films were still silent in the 1920s, but they too conveyed a visual imagery that fed into the novel. And so you have just to give you some pictures of you know, what is populating the city of Berlin. You have these hurdy-gurdy players who would find in the streets, not in the center of town, of course, but in the proletarian neighborhoods, cranking out either folk tunes or current hits. Uh, newspaper vendors were all over the place shouting out the latest news. And remember, Bieberkopf himself was a newspaper vendor at various times. Uh, and then, of course, you have theaters such as this one in the Scheunenviertel in 1929. Now, I said earlier that Dublin despised high culture. What he preferred was precisely the more popular arts and the new media. He did so because they were less pretentious than high culture, but also because he believed they constituted the reality of life in the big city. Dublin believed that there was a continuum between the words and sounds that surround us and our own consciousness. His novel is obviously purely textual. When we read it, we only see words on a page. And it's often hard to tell who or even what is speaking at any given moment. That is in a conventional novel, um, uh, you will have, and then Bieberkopf said, and then there'll be a quotation around what he said or, and then Bieberkopf thought, and there'll be quotes around his thoughts. There's none of that in this novel. You don't have any signals about who or what is speaking at any given time. It's rather a, not exactly a stream of consciousness because it's not one consciousness, it's a stream of texts. Uh, sometimes what we read are the thoughts or spoken words of Bieberkopf or other characters. Sometimes it's the words of the narrator but the narrator is often, is, is very unstable. Sometimes the narrator is omniscient. Sometimes the narrator will pick a figure off the street, which has nothing to do with the plot line and say in 30 years in the 1950s, this person is gonna be doing this. Um, but at other times the narrator says, I don't know what's going on. I don't understand this. Uh, many of the passages in the novel are simply stories literally clipped out of newspapers. So what you have is an effect in the novel, which Ephraim Frisch described uh, this way in a review uh, in the Frankfurter Zeitung. With the words of posters, of electric light ads, of newspaper headlines, with the verses of hits, inner developments are brought to the surface and exterior events are cast as signs into the interior. Dublin does not scorn the cliche, but the cliche is the means whereby impressions imprint themselves onto people in the big city. It's an important insight. I mean, what um, uh, Frisch is saying is that uh, the outside, all of these texts, all of the discourses on the outside imprint themselves into our mind and our mind becomes exteriorized. So in a sense, there is no, it's a very porous border between the inside and the outside in this novel. Now, problems arise because these discourses don't add up to a harmonious whole the messages compete against each other and often contradict each other, you know, certainly in politics. So a character like Bieberkopf, who remains gullible until the very end of the novel, is buffeted and confused 
as he sways between leftist slogans and Nazi jargon, between anarchist rhetoric and a total disinterest in politics, not to mention his swing between respectability and criminality, between self-employment and willful unemployment. Moreover, none of these discourses are adequate to allow expression of one's basic desires and emotions. And that leads to frustration and to outbreaks of violence, including sexual violence. Now, given the importance of the new media in the novel and in Dublin's worldview, it's obvious that those very media would attempt to adapt the novel to the radio or to the screen. Indeed, Dublin himself scripted a radio play based on it, which was almost broadcast in September 1930. A year later, in 1931, he had considerably less influence on the screenplay for an early sound film version of Berlin Alexanderplatz. But there was a paradox in these and all other attempts to audio record or to film the work. The purely textual medium of the novel evokes how the human personality dissolves in a media saturated environment, since it's not always possible to tell who is speaking or thinking. That is, the words on the page consist of an imbrication of competing messages and info bytes. But paradoxically, when the story is retold in precisely those modern media, that aspect gets lost since all of the characters are embodied by actors. Actors who are powerful presences, such as Heinrich Georg in the 1931 film and Gunther Lambrecht in Fassbinder's version. In short, the very image of humanity that is supposedly dissolved by the modern media celebrates its resurrection in the modern media. And I think this paradox is, is well illustrated by this poster for the 1931 film. The novel talks about how the city envelops its characters, but when you embody, uh, when you put the film on screen and it gets embodied in powerful personalities like the actor Heinrich Georde, it's the person comes to dominate the city. In short, because they use an audiovisual medium, film directors like Fassbinder have to reconceive a textual work like Berlin Alexanderplatz and to make it into something very new and different. And I'm going to stop there for now, and we can turn to Johannes, and uh, he will tell us more about Fassbinder. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Peter. There are a lot of um, things I will also uh, touch upon, also, I hope, in the uh, discussion later on. So I think if we now talk about um, the importance that this TV series had for uh, Fassbinder, for, for his career, we must uh, be aware that Berlin Alexanderplatz came rather late in Fassbinder's uh, short but very intensive and incredibly productive uh, life. I mean, let me just remind you that Fassbinder only became 38 years old, but made more than 40 films, two TV series, three short films, wrote 24 theater plays, several radio plays. I mean, it's incredible. In the year 1970, I think he made um, seven films in one year. I mean, it's just... Um, yeah, incredible. So when he did Berlin Alexanderplatz just two years before his death, it was um, actually also um, a culmination point in his career. And it was something he was always working towards because um, Peter already mentioned that. And we know um, from interviews and, and texts by Fassbinder how important um, personally uh, Dublin's novel was for, for Fassbinder. And in particular, one aspect in the, in the novel that he um, highlighted um, uh, always when talking about uh, this novel, and is also to some extent highlighted then in the TV series, namely the relationship between uh, Franz Biberkopf and Reinhold. And Fassbinder argued that it was um, crucial for him, this relationship, it was also crucial for him in order to come into terms with his own uh, bi and homosexuality. Um, and Fassbinder would even go so far that he said uh, this novel literally saved uh, my life. It helped me to survive. So it's therefore also no accident that 
even before he actually made the TV series, references to Berlin Alexanderplatz abound uh, throughout the career of Fassbinder. And probably mo most obviously in his film, uh, Faustrecht der Freiheit, I think the English title is Fox and his Friends, mm -hmm. um, where the main character is named Franz Bieberkopf and is played by no one else than Fassbinder himself. So we see extremely personal, um, it was um, something he for years uh, planned uh, to do. Now, when the series was um, uh, finished and then also just in an incredible, um, in an incredible working schedule, I mean, they, 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 they worked incredibly fast. They shot this uh, whole 15 hours in 150 days, which is pretty incredible. So when the TV uh, series was shown, critics praised it, but the German public rather quickly lost interest. And there was also a newspaper um, propaganda against Fassbinder, which claimed the series was pornographic and, and it would only show like um, the dark sides of Germany and, and so on. So that further helped to turn what should have been really the culmination point in Fassbinder's career into actually a missed chance to some degree. Now, at the same time, I find the fact that the TV series, which should have been this huge success, that this turned into a missed chance is of course somewhat ironically fitting for the story um, it tells um, about the protagonist and his more or less unsuccessful attempt to lead a better life. Um, now, what I think, what I'm particularly interested um, in is also how this series serves as an amalgamation of so many aspects of uh, Fassbinder, of his stories, his interests, and his uh, style. So while Dublin's novel could be said, um, and we heard a lot about that from, from Peter, to give almost like a kaleidoscopic view of, of Weimar culture of the time, um, and a view of the city as a web of influences and discourses to uh, what you said, Peter, um, I think we could, in a similar way, also see how the series for Fassbinder gives a kaleidoscopic view also of Fassbinder and his oeuvre and his themes and topics. Uh, and also, I think, the different audiovisual approaches that are uh, welded together. Because it's really um, an incredibly mixed bag also. Fassbinder's Berlin Alexanderplatz is at the same time television and cinema. I, it's, has often been observed that probably it works even better on the big screen. Um, nonetheless, I think it's also exemplary and very visionary also for, for, for TV or what we later would call then um, quality um, uh, TV with like the new rise of, of, of series and miniseries. So the visual language of Berlin Alexanderplatz at the time was, um, famously deemed as being not clear enough for the small and low resolution TV sets. Um, we have to be aware, I mean, in the 1980s, no huge flat screens in HD yet existed. Also many TV sets would even be black and white TV sets, which of course made it even more uh, difficult for um, this, um, this work to, uh, to shine. So in that regard, we could argue that uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz is probably more cinema than TV. However, I think at the same time, uh, Fassbinder the series is also exemplary in regard to questions of seriality. So I, what I find really interesting is, for example, that Fassbinder uses this length of 15 hours. We would think he would use this length in order to flesh everything out, to, to sort of like um, give us an even more um, close adaptation of the original novel, much closer than the 1931 uh, film uh, could, could achieve because sheer, of the sheer length. But the interesting thing is that actually when you watch Berlin Alexanderplatz by Fassbinder, that you realize that he does not necessarily use the length in order to flesh out the action, but rather to make gaps and ellipses even more striking just because of the sheer length. At crucial moments um, of the story, the camera is far away and sometimes even completely absent. 
so that we only see the results of what we then afterwards must imagine to have happened. So also um, uh, with that, I think I would just quickly, um, to give you an impression, I mean, you have seen the TV series or at least um, uh, already parts of it, um, but also just to give you an, an impression of how also visually um, Fassbinder uh, works, you will see these um, shots um, by the cameraman Xaver Schwarzenberger um, with these very complex uh, settings, both in regard to lighting, to the lighting effects, but also to the, to the effect that so often you would have something in the foreground that would obscure at, le at least um, part of the view. Furthermore, what you also see is that a Fassbinder for um, economic reasons shot the series in 16 millimeter in contrast to the standard cinema um, uh, uh, format of 35 millimeter. Now 16 millimeter, um, um, a much smaller format, which results then of in a in a in a less um, uh, in a less detailed image, but a much uh, softer, even blurred uh, uh, image. So actually, I think it lends itself this effect of the blurred image to the fact that also these, uh, these scenes, the mise-en-scene of the TV series is often also just visually very complex to, uh, to, to understand. And of course, it's also making a point about the character and the character's feeling of being trapped, of not, not being able to get out of his surroundings. Actually also a point that we have seen it on the first edition of the Dublin novel already on the front cover. It, is, uh, it makes also that, um, uh, that point, how much you are at the same time kind of like um, influenced by uh, your uh, surrounding. With that, Fassbinder also picks up on the visual language of the films that he was so fond of. We know that he talked a lot with uh, his cameraman, um, Xaver Schwarzenberg, um, about uh, Josef von Sternberg, uh, the Hollywood movies by Josef von Sternberg. For example, um, a film like Shanghai Express with these very famous, very complex, uh, layered uh, images in which you would always have never just a clear view onto characters, but always have like um, things that uh, obscure um, uh, the, your, your, your view. And you just see that also um, once you look out for that in the TV series, it becomes uh, really striking. We could here, for example, of course, also think about another major influence, probably the, the director that Fassbinder was most influenced by and, and, and very explicitly fond of, um, the um, filmmaker Douglas Sirk, with the uh, Sirk's obsession with mirror uh, views that we will also find in lots of um, Fassbinder films, but also um, in Berlin Alexander plots. Or finally, an image like this, um, in which you have like this with this visual effects again, not only is the image blurred and, and obscured, but also then the, we have a, a, a fractured um, image of our uh, protagonist. So I would argue that um, Fassbinder's Berlin Alexander plots, um, with that, with this constant feeling of being trapped, is also giving you the feeling of rather actually leading nowhere. That they, that you have the feeling of like the main character seems to be stuck in some circular movements, and if you know the whole series and also know the ending, that you will also um, know that I'm not going to spoil anything. But I, but I think we can just say. Um, that Franz Biberkopf is not coming to a closure, neither a happy nor a tragic one, but it's rather that he's being stuck in a sort of limbo. And I think, again, this is what makes for me this series so interesting and also visionary, I think, for TV series, because I think um, with that, um, Fassbinder also picks up on something that is particular about TV series, um, what is so attractive with TV series, but perhaps also so uncanny, namely this feeling of like, that instead of a story arc that leads to a clear ending, 
we would have so often in TV series, just the continuum. And the continuum is, of course, something that we can feel at home. It's, that's the comforting aspects of TV series. That's why we like it just to like revisit the same characters like weekly, week per week, um, uh, what happens to them. But at the same time, this continuum that leads nowhere can, of course, also be felt as a trap. And I think that's very much what then Fassbinder is showing us. Um, so, um, yeah, I, I think I'll just end with one uh, last um, example also in which you, again, you just see the sheer beauty, the mastery of the TV series, but also in conjunction with this idea of um, feeling trapped, how trapped, how a fastbinder does this uh, visually. Um, this is from uh, the second episode, where all of a sudden um, you have this camera movement that gives you the feeling as if the, 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 the characters are frozen in time uh, while the camera um, uh, moves around them. Berlin and West Bend, Brummer Fest, Oben in der Decke, ein vollkommenes Naturwunder im Winter. Seine Stammesgenossen, ah, Gesinnungs- und Katzungsgenossen sind tot, schon tot oder noch nicht geboren. Das ist die Eiszeit, die der einzelne Brummer durchhält und weiß nicht, wie es gekommen ist und warum gerade er. Der Sonnenschein aber, der ist uralt und eigentlich wird alles vergänglich und bedeutungslos bei ihm sieht. Er kommt bei x Meilen her, am Stern Y ist er vorbeigeschossen, Die Sonne scheint seit Jahren, Millionen lang von Nebukadnezar, vor Adam und Eva, vor dem Ichthyosaurus und jetzt scheint sie die tiefste Tiefe einer Untergrundstation. Franz aber ist beschwingt, leicht, überleicht, Licht, leicht, da komme ich her. So, I think it's just striking how the, the, the sheer force of language that we have in Dublin's novel, how in Fassbinder we have like a force of the audiovisual uh, medium in the sense of like the camera is moving, but also you've heard it on the sound level, like music you have, uh, people talking, you have the narrator um, spoken by, by Fassbinder um, uh, uh, himself. And all of that gives you kind of like a maelstrom or, or a whirlwind um, uh, kind of um, uh, feeling. And then to think that, uh, that they shot um, this film in such a short time that they often only did one take, not even two takes, just one take. It's just incredible um, to, to see. I mean, a scene like that normally um, would take uh, days to plan. Um, yeah, so I think, um, yeah, with that, um, I'd like to get into a discussion with, uh, with, with you, Peter. Oh, you have to switch on your microphone. Sorry. That's right. Um, yes, the, excellent. Um, yeah, I'd like to pick up on a couple of themes. Um, certainly, um, as you said, the movie is Fassbinder's vision. It's not Dublin's vision, even though the two overlap in a lot of ways. Certainly, uh, Fass, you know, this was by far the most important book that um, Fassbinder ever read. Um, uh, the actress Ingrid Kaven, with whom he was married for a couple of years, said that Fassbinder had only two goals in his life. And I quote, first, he wanted to make as many films as possible. And second, he tried to live out Berlin Alexanderplatz, end of quote. Um, but it was, it was a very idiosyncratic and personal take on Berlin Alexanderplatz, because as Johannes said, um, the most important part of the novel for him was the relationship between um, uh, Franz and Reinhold. And in fact, he, he talks about um, how when he was 14 or 15 years old and trying to come to terms with his own sexuality, he started reading the novel and he almost gave up. But a third of the way into the novel, suddenly Reinhold's there. And he senses that there is what he considers a great love, and he even calls it a pure love, between Franz and Reinhold. Now, I'm not sure that's in the novel. Certainly, Franz is in love with Reinhold, but I don't think it's reciprocated, um, is my personal reading of the novel. But, but Fassbinder saw it otherwise. And in fact, he identified with both of these characters. Um, as Johannes said in Fox and His Friends, um, uh, Fassbinder plays a character named Franz Bieberkopf. And that's the first overtly gay film uh, with gay characters. 
that Fassbinder ever made. Um, there are many other characters in his films named Franz. And Fassbinder said, I quote again, in everything that I have made, there are figures like Franz Biberkopf. But what's also interesting is originally when he, when he came to filming Berlin Alexanderplatz, Fassbinder uh, wanted to play the role of Reinhold. And at the time he told the cast, I, Fassbinder, I am Biberkopf, I am Reinhold, and I am Mietze. So it's, it's a very personalized image. What gets lost, and I'll just make one more comment. Um, what gets lost really is the city of Berlin. And that's why the novel and, and the, the, uh, the TV series are so different. And partially that has to do with um, the circumstances of making it. Most of um, all of Berlin Alexanderplatz, the novel takes place in what was then East Berlin. And the East German government did not allow Fassbinder's crew to film in East Berlin. So they started by making a few shots in West Berlin in the Kreuzberg district, and then they moved to Munich. And the rest of the film was shot in the um, set of Bavaria Studio. In fact, most of the what seemed to be like Berlin street scenes in the film are actually um, facades built on the lot of Bavaria Studios. But of course, most scenes are interior shots, um, inside shots, uh, which give it this very uh, claustrophobic feel, uh, very different from the expansiveness of the city of Berlin that you get in Dublin's novel. I think it's also in that regard, um, yeah, it, 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 he literally um, sort of like transforms what is a, a, yeah, a view of a whole city into these very, um, almost like close-ups of, of, of characters. And, and it's, yeah, and that he even, I mean, yeah, one, one important reason is what, that, that it was just not possible uh, to have more um, uh, scenes outside. But also if you see the scenes in, in these rooms, you will also realize how uh, stylized they are. I mean, there is not aiming for a kind of like um, uh, realistic um, uh, visuality, but it has something something very stylized you realize of course also like in the in the um like in the first when you look the first episode and and the and in france's room when you see the light coming in from outside you you of course realize that those are just lamps it's not it's nothing outside it's a, it's a it's a set it's a stage but um fassbinder and i think that is of course also something we have in his other films he would use this overt artificiality in order to show like a psychological reality that for him it just served to highlight the reality of the emotion uh, even more and i think that's also something that i always find striking and also what i find more and more um yeah moving in in fassbinder that I, that I realize irony is practically absent in Fassbinder's films. He's very serious. He's very serious about his characters. Although it's very stylized, very artificial, it's not in order to make a point, those are not like real characters. But on the contrast, he, he takes them, he takes them so, uh, so seriously in their, um, uh, in their uh, being stylized. And I think it's just interesting that this is something that sometimes also was, I feel, missed by, by German critics. For example, when, when he insisted on how much he liked the melodramas of Douglas Sirk, or something that the German critics uh, did talk about even less, was like how um, important for him the comedies by Cherry Lewis um, uh, uh, were, they often thought yeah, of course, yeah, but you make these references just in an ironic way. You make it in order to, 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 to make fun about it. And he would insist in his, in, his, um, in, in, in his interviews and in his texts that he would say, no, I, I really think they show these stylized films. They show the dreams and hopes of, again, of the little people, of, of, of the characters and I take these dreams very serious. And of course I show them that they are dreams, that they are fantasies, they're not reality, but them not being reality is not, does not mean that I don't take it seriously, on the contrary. 
Yeah, I, I, um, there is one character in the film who I really like, who was uh, invented by Fassbinder, who's not in Dublin, which can have a comic effect, and that is Frau Bast, the mm -hmm. lady, uh, who I find uh, played by Brigitte Mira. And um, it, it's, it's like a running gag. She's constantly trying to get into the room. She's constantly trying to see everything. And he has to push her out and slam the door on her. And this is like happening all the time. And I think it has something of a comic effect. Um, but the more I think about it, the more though that is serious too, because um, she is nosy, she's wireistic, but so are we. So are we in the audience, especially given the fact, and this is also what makes the film very, Fassbinderian and not Dublinian, uh, there's a lot more sexuality in the film than in the novel and a focus on sexuality. And so this voyeurism um, of, you know, Frau Bast wanting to see everything, that's also the voyeurism of the audience. And that's especially accentuated because a lot of the shots, uh, the camera is over the shoulder of Frau Bast. So we are seeing things from Frau Bast's perspective. That is, we are aligned. Mm -hmm. with this voyeuristic landlady, Frau Bast. Um, mm -hmm. So effects like that, I think, are partially comic, but there's also a serious intention to them, too. And it's also, and and once we also, with Fassbinder, we also have this unique situation that he would so often work with the same actors um, again. And that, of course, enhances this effect even more when we remember that we know Brigitte Mira from other films like Mutter küsst das Fahrt zum Himmel or of course uh, Angst essen uh, Seele auf uh, Fear Eats uh, Soul in which like her desire um, to, be, uh, to be loved, to be in a relationship is like at the center of the film. It of course gives this secondary character in Berlin Alexanderplatz, kind of like a backstory <laughs> that we, when we know Fassbinder, we all of a sudden think, well, but this is not just anyone. This is not just a landlady, but this is Brigitte Mira and she has a story too. And that I also find really interesting how he kind of like, um, I don't know, consciously or unconsciously and plays with all these like different, um, these, these different aspects. So I think I'm joining again. We, we, um, thank you so much, Peter and uh, Johannes. I think you know this background really helps you so much. You know, seeing you, you see the whole series in a, in a different light, and you see it with more knowledge. And um, I, I think that's incredibly helpful. Thank you so much. Um, I, I don't see any questions yet. Maybe people are overwhelmed, but I have a question. And I thought maybe we can quickly touch upon the fact that. Um, that the novel inspired yet another um, uh, interpretation of the, uh, of, you know, uh, a film version uh, which came out last year, uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz by Burhan Kurbani, which is totally different. Um, why do you think this this novel inspires? Um, you know, you said that it's it's not easy to translate into film, but yet you know there there are three major films. Uh, maybe first of all, how did you like the Kobani version, and and why is is it that this novel uh, is, um, gets adapted to the screen so many times? Um, I absolutely, I thought the Kobani, I think the Kobani film is really a masterpiece. It's um, obviously a much more radical rethinking of of the novel than even Fassbinder's version. It's it's set in contemporary Berlin. Uh, Franz Bieberkopf is Francis, a refugee from Africa and um, who is trying to make an honest living in Berlin today and, and simply can't. And it, it deals with today's social issues very well, uh, you, know, uh, you know, extremely well and in a very, very hard hitting manner. Um, why do people turn to Dublin's novel? Um, first of all, it's a unique novel and it's a brilliant novel. Um, it's not, not only the most important novel for someone like Fassbinder, it's also the most important work for someone like Günter Grass. And I think the reason why is because it is so multifaceted, uh, it is so innovative, and it deals with so many social problems without hitting you over the head. It's not a propagandistic work. And I think that this uh, opens up a space where you can, through one main character or a series of characters, deal with social problems in a very direct and also intense way. I mean, I go back to, um, 
what Fassbinder himself said about Berlin Alexanderplatz, it's taking a so-called little person very seriously and making that person as complex as any hero in so-called great literature. And that's a challenge, but also an inspiration uh, for, uh, for movie makers, I think. And I also think um, also to pick up on what you said, Peter, in the in the introduction that this that Dublin's novel being really also a, um, a a exploration of what is possible within the medium of literature. I think that is, of course, something that is very inspiring just to think not so much. How can I adapt? Berlin Alexanderplatz closely to the novel, but rather how can I take this spirit of like thinking about your own medium? I mean, that's also a reason why uh, Walter Benjamin was so fascinated with the with the Dublin novel, of course, that he, he thought it's 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 also thinking about um and um, what what literature could be and how can you combine different uh, media. This uh, um uh, you also mentioned that the, 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 the talk of advertisements um, of, 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 of film, how can I write a multimedia um, a novel, so to speak? I think that can also be in, inspiring then for, for, for other artists that work in, in, in media. How can I make of my own medium a similar uh, use? Now, what I find striking with the new version is, of course, that you also see since Fassbinder did his version, it's also every adaptation of Berlin Alexanderplatz not only has to take into account Dublin's novel, but also Fassbinder's uh, version. Um, it's kind of, and I also find it fascinating in that regard that it's both a rewriting, a reworking of the Dublin novel, but also a take on um, topics and themes that we have in Fassbinder and, and, and what it does differently. And one thing that I also find uh, really striking, I'm not yet totally sure if I'm um, uh, completely um, uh, convinced, but I just find it really interesting aesthetically. It's just like this very unique look that the new version has. This, um, I mean, I talked about the very soft 16 millimeter look of uh, Fassbinder's version. And here we have in the 2020 version, a crisp digital look that almost um, hurts your eye and kind of like it's also working with op, 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 um, making things uh, obscure with like lighting and colors but at the same time it's such a it's it's such a glaring vision uh, uh, almost you have a feeling as, as almost you have to close your eyes um, sometimes so maybe now we should get to some more questions thank you so much for answering that <laughs> Fascinating. So from Daniel, thank you, Daniel, for your question. Um, are there any attri attributable philosophical influences here? The series seems very philosophical and deterministic at the same time, as if what uh, one believes really makes no difference in any case. I don't know which one of you would go for that. Yeah, I think I'm not, um, with that, I'm, I'm, I'm not so, Sure, it's it's Fassbinder would insist that he would say um, there's an interesting moment in Mutter Küster's Fahrt zum Himmel when he talks when the characters talk about and now we have to think something now we have to invent something and Fassbinder would often talk in in interviews about how he felt and um, it is important to hold on to to dreams and fantasies, that this is um, a way um, uh, to survive. So I think, although so many of his films seem to end tragically, and in that way seems deterministic, as if there is no way out, at the same time, it's always a struggle in Fassbinder, something that he wanted to believe and also wanted his films uh, to believe in. So I think it's a very, it's torn. I, I think in, in Berlin Alexanderplatz, also if you watch it, you're really not sure how it will, how it will end. So when I said it's very claustrophobic and circular, 
I nonetheless, I think the TV series nonetheless holds on to this dream of Franz Biberkopf that eventually things could change, that he could get somewhere. Yeah, I don't, I don't see any uh, philosophical influences on Fassbinder or even on Dublin. I mean, what's important in the novel, and there's some of this in the, uh, in the film too, are religious texts. That is, um, uh, there's, you know, you have quotes by Goethe and Heinrich von Kleist in the novel, but they're always ironic. But he also cites the Bible, and it's not ironic. But he picks out the two outlying texts in the Bible, that is, from the Hebrew Bible, he takes the book of Job. And from the Greek Bible, from the Christian Bible, he takes the apocalypse. And those are the two uh, texts in the, in the Hebrew Bible and the Greek Bible, which are very hard to integrate with the others. And um, so th there's the, this powerful religious imagery from the book of Job, from some of the prophets, from the apocalypse. And that, that's part of this textual medium which gives it a, a higher metaphysical dimension, which is very tragic. It, um, uh, especially the, 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 the theme of death and all pervasive death. Um, so that's, it's more like a religious influence on Dublin and indirectly on Fassbinder uh, than a philosophical one, I would say. Um, here's another question from Krishna, uh, seeing as Fassbinder was incredibly prolific writer and director, it would be awesome to hear how Fassbinder's work was produced and financed. I think we touched a little bit on that. Particularly since Berlin Alexanderplatz shows such a seedier side of West Weimar Germany that one often gets overlooked. That often gets overlooked. I mean, we, we kind of talked about that he shot it on 16 millimeter instead of 35, which would have been much more expensive, right? Yeah, and those, of course, the reason that it came late in his career that he kind of like, he had, of course, to build his name um, both as being a successful filmmaker, but also as being a filmmaker who could stay on the budget. And so that, of course, only um, enabled him then to, 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 to take on such a huge endeavor uh, like uh, Berlin Alexanderplatz. So um, I think that's a very um, simple explanation, but I think it's a very crucial one that, that, that Fassbinder was just an incredible professional also. And we tend to forget that when we hear the stories about his, 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 how he behaved with, with, with his, with his lovers and, 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 and the family around him. He at the same time was really just like a very uh, a hardworking professional who, who knew the most important thing is just that you have, to, you have to stay on the budget. And once you do that, you will get your next film financed. Yeah. I mean, obviously it was financed by the um, German state at the time, the German state media. Um, and it was the most expensive. I mean, he had the biggest budget for any film series up to that point, but it still was a budget and he had to keep to it. Um, and then there's a question of which version should you buy if you want to own it on, um, on Blu-ray? Should you buy the US uh, version, uh, Criterion, or Arrow Films in the UK? Uh, is there a difference or, or no, no. quality extras? Is there both Blu-ray, both Blu-rays, as far as I know, they go back to the same uh, uh, restoration. Um, so it's really just more of a matter uh, where you live and what kind of, because you have Blu-ray uh, restrictions, criterion, sadly enough, you cannot play them on European uh, Blu-ray players. So you would, so you would choose the uh, Arrow one or, or even the one by Arthaus, by the German, uh, by the German um, uh, publishing um, DVD and Blu-ray publishing house. And of course, if you're in America, you'll never go wrong with the Criterion edition, which also has a, an interview by with, with, with Peter. So he will certainly vote for the for the Criterion. Uh, yes, I, I'm pushing the Criterion edition. <laughs> <laughs> of course. So, uh, and then another question, I would like to know more about the original broadcast of the Fassbinder series in the US. Was it shown on public television or just in cinemas? And what was the reception like? Don't know that. In, in the US? In the US, yeah. Oh, that's oh, that's something was I don't shown, know about. I mean, to my knowledge, it was only shown in, in theaters, in the movie theater, right? Was it ever on public television? 
No, I doubt that it was on public television. I mean, I've seen it twice in art house cinemas. Uh, well, once um, uh, in the early 80s at Harvard University in Carpenter Center, where it was broadcast, uh, all 15 hours were broadcast over three days, five hours at a stretch. And then I saw it in the original um, Alamo Draft House in Austin, Texas in the wow. late 80s, early 90s, um, before it turned commercial. Um, but um, they, had, they, they actually started out with a Fassbinder series. And I forget if they showed all of Berlin Alexander Platz or just parts of it. Um, well, what I heard is that uh, that it worked much better in the in the movie theater as, as a longer stretch. I mean, the reception in the U.S. was, I think, in general, more positive than uh, in Germany after it was broadcast on television. You know, where it didn't receive such a great reception. Yeah, one problem in Germany with the reception is that. Um, the critics liked it, but the Bild Zeitung and the popular media were just attacking it viciously already uh, uh, before it was even broadcast. They said, you know, this is, uh, it's, it's, it's costly, it's gonna be pornographic because it's by Fassbinder. So the um, public at large was riled up against the film um, uh, before it was even shown. I mean, right now in the pandemic, it really lends itself. I mean, we, we talked a little bit about the uh, popularity of, uh, of, see, of the series right now, you know. I mean, now you really get a chance to spend 15 hours with these characters that you're familiar with. And I think, I mean, we all lived through this year now. And, uh, you know, I, I mean, I can really relate to, uh, to the popularity of a, of a television series. And one can relate to the claustrophobia in the film. Yeah. That's right. I mean, you know, we've all been contained more or less inside and that's what the film's about too. Being contained, being constrained. Yeah. Yeah, and I think maybe with that, we should should close this, this webinar, you know, and then encourage people to go back online and, and watch the, the series, you know, which is uh, gonna be available for another week on Eventive, uh, free of charge. Um, and uh, hopefully that discussion has helped you to enjoy it even more. You know, it really, really helps me at least to, to understand it much better. So I would like to really thank you, um, Peter, Peter and Johannes for, for joining us today. And that was really helpful. We'll post the link on our website and people can go back and, and watch it and I will send it to all of you. Okay. Thank you for joining us. Enjoy your Sunday, whatever's left of it. Thank you too. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye. Thank you. Bye. It was a pleasure.